Okay, your notes today are going to be continuation of Rome, republic to empire. If you recall, a republic is a government where you have representatives making the laws for the people. If you recall from China, for example, an empire is when you have an emperor or a leader, in the case of China, who got power through divine right. We do not have that in this case, but they are a person who ha takes control, as you're going to see. So let's start. Okay, if you think of the dynastic cycle again in China, you remember that the cycles would have a new emperor come into power, and over time people would become dissuaded over the goodness of this person simply because the economy went down. And so here we have the same in Rome. It's not the decline of Rome, note, it's the decline of the Republic. So economic problems, slavery, obviously not popular among slaves, unemployment, farmers couldn't compete with the large states. You're going to see this later again when we get to feudalism. They would lost, lose their jobs and then migrate from the rural areas to the big city, which in this case is Rome. Uh, you're going to see uh, inflation, which means prices rising from the military spending, and a gap between the rich and the poor. In our country today, there is a larger gap <coughs> between the rich and the poor than we've had in the history of the country. It's not unlike Rome. Okay, soldiers, and we're going to see this later when we do something else, uh, writing, are going to become loyal to the generals who lead them and not to the uh, first the republic, but then the empire. And speaking about empires, we need to talk about one of the great Roman rulers, Julius Caesar. He is going to become a consul for one year. If you recall, the consuls were selected, two of them, for one year posts. Uh, he is going to then form a triumvirate, which means three people. And you can see the names, Caesar spelled that way, Pompey and Crassus. And Caesar, you might have heard of a Caesarian birth, comes from Caesar. Uh, he is going to conquer the land of Saul, Gaul, excuse me, and he was appointed governor of Gaul uh, and then invaded Britain. And you can see what Rome looked like at the beginning of the triumphant, the red. And then it's going to expand, and then it's going to expand even further. What happens uh, then is that Julius is going to be seen, or Caesar is going to be seen as a political threat. He's on, he's, but he's very popular with the lower classes. He's ordered by the Senate, remember they're the ones who picked the consul, to leave um, and return to Rome. He refuses, but he defeat, and he defeats Pompey. If you go back here, Pompey is one of the three of the triumphant in what becomes a civil war. Uh, he then forces the Senate to elect him, quote, dictator for life. He is very smart. He starts public works projects. These are buildings, roads, water. They had incredible uh, water uh, aqueducts in the Roman Empire. And that creates jobs that helps the employment. That means, again, the lower classes like him. He ultimately, though, is going to be assassinated in March of 44 B.C. E. And there you got a picture. Obviously, we don't have any real pictures of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Okay, so still the title is still end of the Republic. You don't have to write anything new. We get a tr second triumphant that takes over, Octavian, Mark Antony, not quite the spelling of the singer, and Marcus Lepidus. They are going to defeat Caesar's assassins. They're going to split the empire. Octavian changes his name to Augustus, declares war on Antony. Again, that's one of the 
three people. Octavian becomes uh, the first true emperor of Rome. And here's a little film I wanted you to watch. city in the world, and who ruled Rome became a question of life or death, literally. Here to explain more is Bob Hale with the Roman Report. Bob. Thank you, Sam. Well, you may have heard that Rome wasn't built in a day, and it wasn't. In fact, it took them a whole year, the year 753 BC to be precise, and there it is, slap bang in the middle of Italy, Rome is founded, and it starts as a kingdom, which means it needs a king. There he is. In fact, there were several, right up until 510 BC, when we get one called Tarquin. No, don't laugh, and he's a terrible bully. So bad, in fact, that the Romans just get rid of him. Not just him, but kings all together. Crikey. And Rome becomes a republic. Oh, excuse me. Which means it's now ruled by the Senate. 300 elected senators, which makes it a democracy. A bit like our parliament, but with a lot less shouting. And the busy senators have a massive empire to run, so they appoint people to do stuff for them. Lawmakers and governors and praetors and feasters and angelies and all sorts of other people with silly sounding jobs until Julius Caesar turns up and says, Whoa! There's too many of you and your jobs sound silly. Why not just have one person in charge of everything? Someone like, oh, I don't know, me! Yes, Julius Caesar becomes dictator. He keeps the Senate, basically, he's in charge. A bit like a headmaster, but with a lot less shouting. Then Caesar gets murdered, yeah! And a fellow called Augustus takes over, and he decides the Senate is still too powerful, so he makes himself emperor, and says the Senate can only give him advice. And being emperor is a great job. There's banquets, and power, and helicopters, and money, except not helicopters, and it's so great that everyone wants to be one. People start queuing up to be next, and if they get bored of queuing, then they just kill the current emperor and just take over, like this. Brilliant! Until someone kills them, and then someone kills them, and then, well, you get the picture. There's a lot of dead emperors. In fact, if we look at the Emperometer, we can see that in 193 AD, there were five different emperors in just one year. Woo! With a whopping six in the year 238 AD. And between 238 and 285 AD, there were no less than 25 different Roman emperors. 25! And that ends with Gordian, and Gordian, and Maximus, and Balbinus, and Gordian...